Hey guys, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we will be watching Nobody's Year, Chaos, by Historia Civilis. So in the last video we saw the uh, reformist tribune of the plebs Clodius, how he successfully got a lot of reformist policy through, and how he was sort of taking over the political process, often by using uh, street violence, street, vo street mobs, and uh, populist tactics. We've kind of been seeing this sort of disintegration of political norms in Rome for years at this point, uh, and it seems like we uh, may be continuing that trend. So anyway, let's jump into this reaction. When the chaos for the year 57 BCE assumed office, Rome was in bad shape. Cicero had been banished from the city. Clodius mm. and his supporters were on the streets. Yeah, we saw how uh, in the last video, uh, last year, and if we're looking at the timeline, Clodius managed to get uh, both Cicero and Cato taken out of the picture, um, which is particularly impressive uh, considering Cicero's, you know, just general popularity. I mean, Cicero was a more conservative figure, but he tended to act sort of independently. Um, and he, you know, had a lot of respect and a lot of influence. So it really shows you the level of power that Clodius had and political violence was on the rise. Mm -hmm. Two new consuls were walking into this mess. The first was Lentulus, a well-respected politician on friendly terms with Caesar and Pompey, as well as Cicero. The second was Metellus Nepos. He was not well-respected. He was hmm. a populist who had got into a bit of a tussle with Cato in 62 BCE, which had ended with him being humiliated and fleeing Rome in disgrace. Wow. But he was one of Pompey's people, and Pompey's support was enough to secure for him the consulship. Yeah, I mean, throughout this time in Roman politics, we've seen the influence of the first triumvirate, uh, which was an alliance between Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus. Pompey provided sort of the uh, respectable, well-liked general. You know, he provided a lot of legitimacy. Crassus provided the funds. He was extremely rich. And Caesar provided sort of the popularity. You know, he was a rising populist star, um, so he, he had popularity among the people. Uh, and this uh, political alliance really shaped Roman politics during these years. Cicero's younger brother, Quintus, went to Pompey at the beginning of the year to make a deal on his brother's behalf. He promised that if Pompey could get Cicero's banishment lifted, Cicero would agree not to criticize Pompey, Caesar, or Crassus openly. Really? Remember that these three were in a secret alliance. Right. Pompey agreed, but he had to run it by his allies first. I mean, maybe Cicero will hold to that. I find it hard to believe he would hold back from criticizing anybody. Um, but, you know, also, like I said, Cicero was well-respected. You know, he was not uh, necessarily allies of the triumvirate, but... You know, they there was a, a certain level of mutual respect, you know, particularly between uh, Pompey and Cicero. Um, so, you know, they were not political allies. They were often political opponents on opposite sides of the aisle, but they didn't necessarily, you know, hate each other or, you know, the Pompey and Caesar didn't want to see Cicero exiled necessarily. So a messenger was sent to Caesar in Cisalpine Gaul. Initially, Caesar wasn't super supportive. He was still feeling sore towards Cicero for not supporting his agenda during his year as consul. Okay, well, maybe Caesar was a little salty. I think in general, you know, he didn't necessarily dislike Cicero. And as you're seeing, the reason here is that he wanted to cooperate with Cicero, and Cicero refused. So Caesar's a little butthurt. But, you know, uh, there's... There is a sort of general respect. I mean, as you can tell from the fact that Caesar is upset that Cicero wouldn't work with him, clearly there's a respect there. But getting this kind of concession from one of Rome's most influential politicians was too good to pass up. He agreed. Crassus had no special quarrel with Cicero, so he was cool with it too. Mm. With that, it was decided. <clears throat> Pompey pulled some strings, and at the Senate's first meeting, Lentulus put forward a proposal to lift Cicero's banishment. Cicero's personal popularity in the Senate remained high, so yeah. that wasn't the problem. The problem was that the Senate had been strong-armed by Clodius the year before, and had felt pressured to force Cicero into exile. But with Lentulus introducing the bill, and Metellus Nepos supporting it, and Pompey speaking passionately on its behalf, everybody felt comfortable getting on board. It passed with a huge majority. 
As always, the legislation went to the public assembly to be rubber stamped by the people. Clodius was no longer in elected office, but he was still a senator and had voted against the bill. And more hmm. importantly, he still had his gangs of supporters out on the streets. On the day of the vote, Clodius showed up with his gang, which included a bunch of gladiators armed with swords. Uh-oh. Let's not gloss over this. Up to this point, political violence had been somewhat normalized in Rome. Pushing and shoving had become common. Open street fights between different factions were becoming more and more frequent. But make no mistake, Clodius was bringing this to a whole new level. That's exactly right. I mean, you know, mobs of people fist fighting, basically, political mobs, violence in the streets, that's bad enough. That's already um, sort of a death knell for your democracy, to be honest, your republic. But bringing, you know, armed guards, gladiators with you, and that is escalating it to, like Historius Villa said, a whole nother level, you know. I mean, it's been obvious for years at this point, and many of the videos we've seen that, uh, you know, Roman Republican institutions are not healthy at this point, and this is just sort of another example of that. All of our sources say that he brought gladiators, but don't forget that these were professional killers and Clodius was paying them. We have yeah. a word for that. Mercenaries. Armed yeah. with swords. Rome was supposed to be a demilitarized zone, and swords were forbidden in the city. I can't overstate how significant this was. This was looking more and more like an armed militia. Clodius's supporters moved against the public assembly, and there's no other way to say it. It was horrible. Dead bodies covered the streets, and people Jesus. fled in terror. Several of the tribunes of the plebs were seriously wounded, which, let's not forget, was a death penalty offense. Cicero's brother, Quintus, was there to see the lifting of his brother's banishment, and he survived the slaughter. I mean, I expected some violence to break out, but I didn't expect a slaughter. I mean, jeez. People being wounded, you know, with by sword-wielding gladiators, mercenaries, and people being killed. Yeah, wow, this is really going off the deep end. Only by crawling under some bodies and pretending to be dead. Jesus. Titus Aeneas Milo was a popular conservative tribune of the plebs, and for him, this was a life-altering experience. He decided, on that day, that the only way to put an end to this political violence was to fight fire with fire. Oh, see, here we go. And this is how it happens. You know, when you have a Republican system and you start seeing negative signs like these from one side, because, you know, keep in mind at this point, the popular violence has been from the reformist faction. Uh, the reformers wield the power of the mob um, to push through policy. That's bad enough. When the other side, whatever the other side is, in this case it's the conservative faction, decide, you know what? We've got to fight back. We've got to do it too. This is when everything really starts to crumble. I mean, you're way too far gone at this point. Milo rallied his supporters and told them to take to the streets. He then enlisted his own cadre of gladiators, or mercenaries, whatever uh -oh. calling them, and illegally armed them with swords of their own. From that moment on, whenever Clodius showed up and started to cause trouble on the streets, Milo responded by rallying his supporters and causing trouble in return. Violent clashes broke out all over the city, and the death toll skyrocketed. Mm. We have one description of the Tiber being filled with corpses, and the ground on the Forum being covered in blood. Jesus. This wasn't just gangs getting into fistfights anymore. These were men armed to the teeth, showing up with the intent to kill. This was anarchy. I mean, yeah, if you... If your state cannot even prevent this level of political violence, uh, how legitimate is your state at that point? You no longer have, uh, you know, control of the law. Your rule of law has fallen apart. Um... Clearly, with all of the violence and murder at this point that's happening. As the body count continued to rise, public opinion began to turn. The mob violence was horrifying, and mm. normal citizens began to call for Cicero's return. There are two reasons for this. First, people were hopeful that the violence would stop if Cicero's banishment was taken off the table. Second, Cicero was most well known for being the guy who restored order during the Catiline Conspiracy. Yeah. This rule of law kind of conservatism was now looking pretty good, and as <laughs> a result, Cicero's personal popularity soared. 
If Cicero was popular in Rome, he was a rock star in the rest of Italy. He had been born a provincial Italian, not a native Roman, and the Italians viewed him as one of their own. It helped matters that he put in the work to maintain these relationships, especially with some of the richer landowners in the countryside. Pompey could sense that Rome was approaching a tipping point, so he went on a tour of Italy, giving speeches and whipping up support. And this is, you know, kind of rare. Um, you know, at this point in Rome, the city of Rome was, you know, the center of political life. And, like, when I say the center, I mean almost exclusively uh, it was focused on, you know, the rest of the empire, even the rest of the Italian peninsula, did not get much love, which is why, you know, Cicero was, was unique, because he was a provincial, you know, he wasn't from Rome, and he'd curried favor um, with a lot of the uh, Italian notables throughout the peninsula, particularly in southern Italy. Um, and now Pompey's doing this sort of uh, campaign throughout Italy, you know, the, the, this is fairly unique, but... Uh, a pretty effective way to gather sort of broader support, you know, more than just the city of Rome itself, particularly when the city seems to be devolving into mob violence. People from all over the countryside began to flood into Rome to voice their support for overturning Cicero's banishment. Mm. With Cicero's popularity higher than ever, the consul Lentulus launched a trial balloon. He introduced some legislation that didn't actually do anything except formally thank everybody in Rome who was working to get Cicero's banishment lifted. <laughs> this passed with plenty of support and got through the public assembly without any violence. That was a good sign, so for the second time, he introduced the legislation that would formally lift Cicero's banishment. And again, Clodius voted against the bill, but it didn't matter. It passed with plenty of support. When it went before the public assembly, many powerful senators joined together and spoke to the crowd in support of the bill. Milo and his hired gladiators, armed with swords, were lined up protecting the stage. Mm -hmm. Clodius showed up with his supporters, but when he... I mean, it shows you to what point we've reached where now these basically armed mercenaries are needed to protect legitimate political activity. Um, uh, and let's hope they do prevent violence in this case. Uh, though even if they do, like I've been saying, it's not a good sign. <laughs> Saw Milo's show of force, that scared him off. The bill right. was approved by the public assembly pretty much unanimously. Cicero was free to re-enter the city. Hey! <laughs> when he finally did, he was greeted with cheering crowds. Cicero spoke before the Senate and singled out Pompey, thanking him for working tirelessly behind the scenes to get his banishment lifted. And with Cicero finally back in the Senate, it was back to business. Hey, well, shout out to Cicero. I mean, it's not fun being banished, but it, it must have been a pretty good return. Um, I mean, he was banished for completely political reasons, though the justification was uh, the execution of the Catiline conspirators without a trial. Um, and I, I do agree that that was not necessarily a great move. I would have preferred a trial leading up to uh, consequences. Um, I, I think the straight-up execution was not a great move, but, you know, given the situation, uh, it kind of made sense that uh, some drastic action needed to be taken, and, uh, you know, I don't think Cicero deserved to be banished for it. You know, he's there's a lot more to him than that. He was a popular and well-respected guy. So, uh, you know, a, a good return to the city uh, from Cicero. The most pressing issue to attend to was the fact that Rome was currently in the middle of a food shortage. Hmm. Clodius's grain program, which had been passed last year, had promised free food to the urban poor. Right. Supply simply couldn't keep up, and Rome's granaries were dry. Cicero suggested that the Senate appoint a special commissioner to take command of Rome's agricultural supply chain. This commissioner would have unilateral authority to go and fix the problem, with the power to override regional governors or generals. So that's a lot of power. Uh, that's a lot of power for one individual to have. Uh, and of course, well, I'm not sure if, in what sense Cicero uh, suggested this. I would hope he suggested it in sort of a non-political sense. Like, we need to solve this issue. Let's put someone who's qualified into this position. But whether or not he suggested it like that, you can see the obvious political implications of creating a position like that. You know, someone in that position could really alter uh, the grain dole, uh, you know, pretty strongly. So, you know, 
based on their position, I mean, some people were very strongly pro, uh, you know, giving out grain and expanding it, and some were more opposed. So this is a powerful position to create. Cicero then suggested that Pompey be that man. Lentulus seized on this idea and formally put it before the Senate. With Cicero's support and the support of both consuls, it passed easily. We can kind of piece together the deal that was made here. Mm. Cicero's banishment gets lifted with the help of Pompey, and now Pompey gets a powerful assignment. With yeah, okay, so seems like Cicero did not necessarily suggest it as a completely non-political position. There were clearly uh, some goings-on uh, behind the scenes. Uh, you know, Cicero needed to thank Pompey for helping him out. With the help of Cicero, Pompey left Rome to go and fix the grain situation. And Pompey being Pompey, he did it in no time at all and made it look easy. <laughs> Cicero was emboldened by his renewed popularity and had some scores to settle. Uh oh. Shortly after Pompey left Rome, Cicero marched up to the Capitoline Hill with a small group of supporters took the tablet that listed Clodius's accomplishments during his year as tribune of the plebs and destroyed it. <laughs> wow. He then gave a speech, arguing that none of Clodius's actions as tribune of the plebs were valid because his conversion from patrician to plebeian was illegal. Keep in mind that Pompey and Caesar had been the ones to oversee this conversion. Cicero had a legitimate feud with Clodius, but indirectly dragging Pompey and Caesar into it makes it seem like Cicero was beginning to go back on his promise not to criticize them openly. Yeah, kind of a bit of a messy situation. Um, plus, I mean, Cicero was not subtle about it. You know, he just went right to the point. You know, Clodius' actions uh, were not legitimate um, and... Uh, should not be treated as such. So there was no disguising what was being said. Cicero went straight for it. Cicero was making an extremely controversial claim, and at the next Senate meeting, Cato slapped him down by saying wow. that it would be extremely irregular for them to overturn an entire year's worth of legislation. Cicero I mean, and that's saying something, because Cato was a strong conservative. Clodius was the exact opposite, a radical reformer. Um, so... You know, for Cato to say uh, that we shouldn't overturn uh, his actions, you know, that, that, that means something. Cicero was clearly out for blood, which is why he had opened this full frontal assault on Clodius's entire legislative legacy. Mm. But with that avenue closed to him, Cicero began to make it clear that he was particularly interested in overturning a specific piece of legislation, which he considered to be a highly symbolic, lingering personal attack against him. While Cicero had been banished, Clodius had had Cicero's home in the center of Rome demolished and had erected a temple to liberty in its place. So petty. You know, this political infighting, some of it is so incredibly... I mean, it's so personal. You know, you have the man banished, then you destroy his home. It's ridiculous. To Cicero, this was a daily reminder of his humiliation, and he felt that the only way to complete his political comeback was to rebuild his home. I mean, honestly, you know, I, I don't necessarily think Cicero should be, you know, solving personal issues through political avenues, but I can't blame him here. I mean, I'd be pretty angry, too, if my home was destroyed when I got banished and I came back and there was a temple in its place. I think, I, I mean, I would frankly also be infuriated. I would want my home rebuilt. So I, I see where he's coming from. The problem was you couldn't just tear down a temple. It was a religious issue which took him before a body we're now familiar with, the College of Pontiffs. Mm. Remember, Caesar was the Pontifex Maximus, which meant that he was supposed to oversee the College of Pontiffs, but he was off in Cisalpine Gaul, which meant that the college kind of governed itself. Mm. Cicero made his arguments to them, and when he was done, the college discussed the case behind closed doors. Finally, they came to a decision and made their report to the Senate. The college decided that it didn't feel comfortable overturning all of Clodius's laws, since the Senate had actually affirmed all of his actions when they had voted in favor of his legislation. Right. But taking into account the Senate's acknowledgement that they had acted foolishly when they banished Cicero, the college said that they would be comfortable with changing the designation of the temple, allowing it to be demolished if Cicero wished. On top of this ruling, the Senate voted to foot a portion of the bill to rebuild Cicero's home. This was a big symbolic victory for Cicero, even though he would go on to complain that the Senate was deliberately snubbing him by refusing to pay 100% of the cost. 
Hmm. You just can't please some people. Yeah. I mean, he seems like a pretty good outcome. I get it. He'd want the whole thing paid for. Uh, that is understandable. But it seems pretty good. I mean, you know, your Cicero's reputation has been rehabilitated. He's allowed to tear down the temple. And, you know, part of the rebuilding costs are being paid for. That's a pretty good outcome for him. Clodius was pretty upset by the Senate's rebuke, even if it was symbolic. Mm. Once the construction crews started work on Cicero's home, Clodius and his gang attacked, chasing oh, them away. Jesus. This wasn't quite enough for them, so they also attacked Cicero's brother's home, which was nearby, and set it on fire. What? what, what this guy's a menace. He can't help himself. Just every single issue was solved by political violence to Clodius. I mean, at this point, you know, obviously this is political. Like, you know, Cicero wants to show that he's back and his reputation has been rehabilitated. But it's also pretty personal. Like, he's just he's trying to rebuild his home and you're going to use violence to prevent that from happening. It's pretty crazy. Not long after this, Cicero was walking down the street when Clodius' gang attacked him. Uh oh. They were all throwing rocks, and he could see that some had swords. He darted into the home of one of his supporters, and a crowd gathered outside to fend off Clodius' gang. When it's no longer safe for senators to go about their daily business, you know the political violence is out of control. Yeah, I mean, look, here in America, uh, our system, uh, you know, it's not at its best point right now. We, we have a lot of instability. But, I mean, can you imagine a situation in which, you know, opposing politicians, opposing senators are, you know, walking around the streets of D.C. with armed gangs fighting each other? I mean, when we get to that point, we're truly far gone. I mean, just, I mean, or, you know, imagine that in reference to uh, your own country if you live in a relatively stable democracy. It's just, it's kind of crazy to think about, and that's exactly what's happening here. The continuing threat of this violence had forced the elections to be postponed several times. But finally, late in the year, they were held, and mm. Clodius was elected edile, proving once and for all that his support remained strong, even after a year of setbacks at the hands of Milo and Cicero. Yep. At this point, Clodius and Milo were at each other's throats, each at the head of their own militia. Political rhetoric had reached unprecedented heights, with the two men openly threatening to murder each other in public. <laughs> oh no. And, sadly, it would only get worse. Well, I mean, I can see why this one was called Nobody's Year. Chaos. What a chaotic uh, situation. Um, and, you know, you can see some of the uh, parallels to our sort of current polarization and instability. Uh, obviously, we're not nearly at this point, but you can kind of imagine if things keep getting worse, we could end up moving closer to something like this, which we very much do not want. Um, anyway, you know, uh, I really enjoy Historia Civilis' videos. Um, I particularly like the ones on uh, Roman politics. I find late Republican politics really interesting, um, just really fascinating uh, situation with sort of the deterioration of these Republican norms uh, and the increase in political violence um, and coercion. You know, it's just a really interesting period. So yeah, um, if you guys enjoyed this one, please leave a like, subscribe to the channel, check out the Patreon, and uh, like I mentioned earlier, um, uh, you know, stick around for more, you know, uh, keep, keep watching. I'll keep reacting to videos. Um, so yeah, I hope all you guys are having a good day, and I hope to see you guys again next time. Goodbye.